Well, welcome to our afternoon session. I hope everybody had uh, enjoyed their lunch, had a good opportunity to meet other people and have a good chat and spend lots of money on the book stand. <coughs> if you didn't, you're going to have an opportunity later. Please don't miss it. So welcome to the afternoon and to John's second session when he's going to be talking to us about the implications of Jesus' uniqueness. John. Shall we pray again before I lecture? We desire to thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have made us rational human beings in your own image and likeness, that you've given us the capacity to think. We also thank you that you've given us in Scripture a revelation of yourself out of which to do our thinking. We also thank you for the Holy Spirit you have given us to be our teacher, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in our knowledge of you. And we thank you for the Christian community as the context within which to think in submission to your word, seeking the illumination of your spirit. Grant that all these things may come together this afternoon. We ask it for the glory of your great name. Amen. I'm proposing that we look at the implications of the uniqueness of Christ under the rubric, the proclamation of Christ. Because the six things into which I want to go, briefly, all have to do with world evangelization, proclamation, mission, and they bring the uniqueness of Jesus and the proclamation of Jesus together in our thinking, which I think is very important. Because if Jesus Christ is unique, then we must make him known. We cannot maintain a monopoly of the gospel. We cannot keep to ourselves this knowledge of the unique Jesus which has been given to us. We must be faithful to the great New Testament affirmations of his uniqueness and his finality we must give full weight to them, we must not tone them down, and we must have the courage to make them known to others. So here are some of the great affirmations. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Here is the second, Acts 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in nobody else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And then the third is 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and human beings, himself human, Christ Jesus. So there you have the three major affirmations of the uniqueness and the finality of Jesus Christ. According to the New Testament, there is only one way, there is only one name, and there is only one mediator. The claim is exclusive. Indeed, the inclusiveness of the Christian mission derives from the exclusiveness of the Christian claim. It is because we make the exclusive claim that only Christ is Lord and Saviour that we must be inclusive in our mission of making salvation, the gospel, known to everybody. It's the one and the all brought together. Because there is only one Saviour, he must be made known to all. But the commitment, our Christian commitment to world evangelization as a direct consequence of the uniqueness of Jesus, needs to be hedged round with every possible safeguard, lest it be misunderstood, lest it be misrepresented, as it often is. For Christian evangelism has been much abused by us, and it has therefore not infrequently fallen 
into disrepute. There is already enough offense in the gospel of Christ crucified. Don't let add to the offense of the cross any unnecessary personal blunders of our own. Because Christian evangelism has, I'm afraid, often, well, I said this, been mis been abused. And it's really these things that I want to go into in the six points you have on your outline. I state these six points, as you may notice, in negative form. There are, if you like, six disclaimers. There could also be six uh, resolves on our part that we will not bring evangelism into disrepute by these follies. So here is the first. Commitment to world evangelization does not mean that we confuse Christ and culture. That is to say, in world evangelization, it is the unique Jesus that we are called upon to proclaim. We proclaim him according to the scriptures and not according to one or other of our Western images of him, such as Elaine introduced us to this morning. We must be sure that the Jesus we proclaim is the biblical Jesus and not a cultural Jesus. But that's easier said than done. Because we are all creatures of culture, no human being who's ever lived has not been a creature of culture. And we have imbibed our cultural inheritance from our parents. We've drunk it in like with our mother's milk, much more than we customarily realize. Our cultural inheritance has profoundly affected everything that goes to make up our identity. The way we see things, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we do everything is influenced by our cultural background. So, as a result, even the gospel we preach often has a thick cultural overlay. And some Western missionaries have made the mistake of exporting to the country of their adoption well, Dr. René Padilla of Argentina at the Lausanne, first Lausanne Congress in 1974 called a culture Christianity. People from the West, from the United States and Europe, were quite offended by that title 20 years ago. But I personally think he was absolutely right because what missionaries export is often the gospel as distorted by their own cultural prejudice or presupposition. Even sometimes they have exported the American or the European way of life under the guise of the gospel. Or they have exported a gospel wrapped in the Union Jack or in the Stars and Stripes or in some other flag. Now when that happens, as it often has, the gospel is rejected by the people to whom we take it, not because they perceive it to be false, but because they perceive it to be alien. It seems to them to belong to a culture other than their own culture, to be a foreign import or a foreign implant. And we need to repent of this folly. We don't claim uniqueness for any culture Christ. We only claim uniqueness for the biblical Christ, according to the witness of the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New. And if our evangelism is to be acceptable, if it is to be effective, then it must be biblical, derived from Scripture. It must be contextualized, made relevant to the people to whom, with whom we share it, but it must not be alienated from them by our own set of cultural presuppositions. Enough said, I think, on that first point. Commitment to world evangelization does not mean or should not mean that we confuse Christ with culture. B. Commitment to world evangelization does not mean that we should exhibit a crusading spirit Many adherents of other faiths 
feel threatened not by the fact that Christians are committed to evangelize them, to bring them the good news, but by the manner in which we set about it. And some Christian evangelism, I have no doubt, is a thinly disguised form of imperialism. Sometimes cultural imperialism, but other kinds as well. It is sometimes self-centered in its purpose, because what we're really wanting is the glory of our church, or the glory of our parachurch organization, or our own glory. Partly because it is haughty in attitude, and partly because it is aggressive in style. I wonder if you've ever noticed, you must surely have done, how often we speak of evangelism in military terms. We talk about mounting a campaign or mounting a crusade. It's a great blunder to use that word if you're within 10 miles of Muslims who have never forgiven us for the crusades in the Middle Ages. Now the Crusades to me are simply a chapter in the history book of Europe or of the world. But when I started traveling in the Middle East, I found to my astonishment that the Crusades are still a living issue with Muslims. They've never forgiven us. It was an unholy blunder of seeking to recapture the so-called holy places by force in the name of Jesus. And then we use other military terms, not only the campaign and the crusade, but we talk about targeting a particular group or people. Or we talk about imitating commandos and organizing an evangelistic raid. Now I ask, what kind of image does that create in people's minds when you use military vocabulary for evangelism? It creates an entirely false impression. It creates the impression that those we want to win for Christ are our enemies. That's implicit in all this language, military language. It gives the impression that we are militants who are determined to take them captive by force. And that we don't mind if in doing so we do them considerable damage in the process. All this is implied if you use military language. I personally believe that we should purge our vocabulary and that we should drop all this military language deliberately. It's not compatible, as far as I see it, with the spirit of humility and gentleness which were exhibited by our Lord Jesus. He himself spoke of being meek and lowly in heart and the Apostle Paul could beseech the Corinthians about something on the basis of the gentleness and the meekness of Christ. I would love to see a far more gentle spirit in evangelists, even when they are preaching the gospel, instead of being aggressive in style. So not only did Jesus exhibit humility and gentleness, but these things are preeminent Christian virtues and indispensable to the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Then under this same heading of the crusading spirit, I would like to talk to you for a few moments about proselytization and whether there is any difference between evangelization and proselytization. Because I want to suggest that it is crusading evangelism that is a form of proselytism. Now it's perfectly true that all evangelism is sometimes represented by those we seek to evangelize in terms of proselytism, and of course that is a very pejorative word. But to call all evangelism proselytism and not to distinguish between them is very unfair and quite untrue. So what is the difference? If you're interested in pursuing this, I recommend to you two reports, one produced in 1970 and one in 1980, by a joint committee of the World Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic Church. And both reports are entitled Common Witness. And uh, although I shall use my own words now, this is partly the kind of thing that they say in these reports. What is the difference between evangelism and proselytism? Evangelism 
is authentic witness in which Christians seek to persuade people by making an open, honest statement of the truth and by trusting the Holy Spirit to demonstrate their words in the mind and the conscience of the hearer. I'll say that again. Evangelism is authentic witness in which Christians make an open, honest statement of the truth and look to the Holy Spirit to carry it home, to demonstrate it. Now, you'll see the importance of that when I come to proselytism. Proselytism, by contrast, is an unworthy witness. It's not authentic, it's an unworthy witness in which Christians distort the truth by caricaturing the beliefs and practices of the other people, offer inducements to converts, and resort to psychological pressure techniques. And those are three aspects of an unworthy witness, as opposed to an authentic one. In the authentic one, we're just openly stating the gospel and relying on the Spirit. But in the unworthy witness, there is a distortion of the truth, a caricaturing of the other people's viewpoints. I mean, if you're uh, an evangelist in the Muslim world, then you, you caricature uh, Muhammad and the Quran and so on. And you also offer these inducements to converts that if they come to Christ, they'll get free medical treatment in the uh, Christian hospital next door. Uh, these are, this is making what they call rice Christians, you know, because they're offered rice alongside the gospel, and a resort to psychological pressure techniques, trying to force conversion upon people. So there really is a difference, and the major difference is between gentleness and force. So that's my second point. Now my third. A commitment to world evangelization does not mean that we neglect social action. If in evangelism we are proclaiming the unique Jesus, then we must present the authentic Jesus in his New Testament fullness. And that means not least as the visible embodiment of the love of God. We must present him as even more committed to the welfare of sinners and the sinned against, of the poor and the powerless, than the founders of all other religions and ideologies, including Marx. I'll give you an example to make my point. You remember how in, was in 1973, Salvador Allende, the Marxist uh, president of Chile was assassinated, probably assassinated, and just after his assassination, the Roman Catholic bishop of Rio Bamba, south of Quito in Ecuador, arranged a mass for students in memory of Salvador Allende. And in the course of his sermon, because, uh, did I tell you the, no, I didn't tell you his name. It's Bishop Leonidas Proanio. He has died since, but he was a distinguished uh, Roman Catholic bishop at the time. Very concerned himself for social justice, and not least for the Indians whose culture was being destroyed, and who, whose culture he wanted to see preserved, etc. Anyway, there was this uh, mass, and in the course of his sermon, Bishop Proanio spoke about Jesus. Jesus the lover of the poor. Jesus the critic, the radical critic of the establishment. Jesus who not only preached the gospel but gave compassionate service. That is the real Jesus of the gospels. When he finished there was a question time and you know what these students said? They said almost together, unitedly. If we had known this Jesus we would never have become Marxists. Now I said to myself, are we driving young people and students into the arms of Marx because we are presenting a false Jesus? 
A Jesus who doesn't care about the poor and the marginalized and the oppressed and the sinned against, but is only interested in salvation from sin. Ah, but the true Jesus wasn't like that. Let's think then about the true Jesus. For a, I'd like to divide this, subdivide it under his example and then his commission. First, his example. Jesus not only announced the arrival of the kingdom of God, he demonstrated its arrival in deeds of compassion and power. That is to say, in his ministry, words and works went together. They were combined. And they need to be combined, if you think about it. Words are very abstract things unless and until they are made concrete in works so that we can see them. Works, on the other hand, are ambiguous things unless and until they are interpreted and explained in words. So words explain works and works dramatize words. So words and works go together. They went together in the example of Jesus. It should surely be the same for us. Of course the gospel has to be verbalized. It has to be put into words, and that carefully. But it also needs to be made visible. It's interesting that Jesus in the New Testament is called both the image of God to be seen and the word of God to be heard. But the image was made audible and the word was made visible. You know, the word was made flesh and we saw his glory. So the audible and the visible need to go together in evangelism today. Our light shines, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that it's most bright when they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Good news and good works belong together in the proclamation of the gospel. So that's the example of Jesus. Now I say a few words about the commission of Jesus. And I'd like to mention the most neglected form of the Great Commission, which is the one in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, where Jesus says, echoing what he has already said in his prayer in John 17, he says to them, As the Father sent me into the world, so I send you into the world. Where he very clearly made his mission in the world the model for our mission in the world. He sends us in the world as the Father sent him into the world. How did the Father send him into the world? Answer by incarnation. He sent him into the world so that he had to enter into the world to which he came. Surely it's legitimate to say that if our mission is to be modeled on his, we too have to enter into other people's worlds. All authentic Christian mission is incarnational mission. It's not preaching the gospel from a distance. It's entering into people's worlds. I've always liked very much some words of Michael Ramsey, former Archbishop of Canterbury, in a little book of his called Images Old and New, which was his archiepiscopal critique of John, Bishop John Robinson's book, uh, Honest to God. It was a critique of secular theology, it was called. And Archbishop Michael Ramsey put it beautifully like this. He said, we state and commend the faith, if you like, we evangelize, only in so far as we go out and put ourselves with loving sympathy inside the doubts of the doubter, the questions of the questioner, and the loneliness of those who have lost the way. It's beautifully eloquent. It's incarnational evangelism, entering other people's worlds, putting ourselves with loving sympathy inside their doubts, their questions, their loneliness, their alienation. It's entering their world in order to win them for Jesus Christ. Now that means entering into their thought world, listening to them, struggling to understand their misunderstandings of the gospel, and not only entering their thought world, but entering their heart world, the world of their pain and their alienation, 
And it involves, and this is my point here, entering into the world of their social reality. Whether it's poverty or unemployment or whatever it may happen to be, we can't barge in and preach the gospel to people while ignoring their social reality. We have to enter into their world and make common cause with them and then share the good news with them from inside where they are. So I'm arguing that both the example of Jesus and the commission of Jesus forbid us to neglect social action. They encourage us to find creative ways to fuse evangelism and social concern. It's my third point. How are we getting on? A, B, C. D. A commitment to world evangelization and the proclamation of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ does not mean that we reject dialogue. Now I know very well that some Christian evangelists uh, have red lights flashing in their mind whenever the word dialogue is mentioned and they say that we are called exclusively to proclamation and that there is no place for dialogue or debate. The gospel, they say, is to be proclaimed. It is not to be discussed in dialogue. And I know, of course, what they mean and agree with it to some degree. But some evangelists maintain that any form of dialogue is to compromise the gospel and, to, and is incompatible with the uniqueness of Jesus. That's what they say. I say, not so. We need to distinguish between two true and false dialogue. It is perfectly true that the World Council of Churches, which has a whole department committed to dialogue, does recommend a dialogue that I personally and probably you could never engage in. They recommend that when two people, a Christian and a non-Christian, engage in dialogue, they both lay aside their convictions they rid their minds of prejudice. They enter into the dialogue with absolute openness and they are prepared either side to be converted. So the Christian says, well, I'm prepared to become a Buddhist and the Buddhist says, I'm prepared to become a Christian and they come in with a kind of uh, tabula rasa, a mind, a screen from which everything has been wiped clean. If I may say so, it is absurd. It is ludicrous. It's asking us to take off all our convictions as we take off our clothes when we go to bed at night. It is an invitation to us to be guilty of a lack of integrity by pretending to be other than we actually are. But when we enter into a dialogue, both sides have got to retain their own integrity. The Buddhist entering the dialogue remains a Buddhist. The Christian entering it remains a Christian because that's what we are. We don't pretend to be anything else. And it would be totally artificial and mechanical for us to attempt to do so. So that's false dialogue. True dialogue, properly understood, is simply a two-way conversation in which we are prepared to listen as well as talk. In which we are prepared to learn as well as teach. And there is no compromise in that. Dialogue is simply a mark of humble respect to other people who are also human beings as we are made in the image of God. And indeed, dialogue neither replaces nor rivals proclamation. Its great reward, maybe its only reward, is increased understanding. We listen in order to understand. Then dialogue becomes a prelude to evangelism and our witness is much more appropriate and relevant because we've been humble enough to, wit to listen to the other person's point of view. So dialogue in no way is incompatible with the uniqueness of Jesus. On the contrary, as we listen to the other person, we shall become ever more convinced of the uniqueness of of Jesus Christ. I'll give you an example. Most of you heard the name of E. Stanley Jones, a distinguished American missionary in India during the 20s, a close friend of Gandhiji, um, a Methodist Episcopal uh, missionary. 
And it, he wrote the Christ of the Indian Road, the Christ of uh, every road, the Christ of the Round Table. And East Stanley Jones was really the founder of the whole idea of dialogical evangelism or dialogue. He used to have what he called Round Table Conferences in which uh, some Hindus and some uh, Muslims and Christians would sit round, probably on the floor, around a low-lying table, and they would listen to one another. They'd all go around the circle sharing uh, from uh, the deepest experiences that they had had. Uh, let me quote from Stanley Jones, from his book, The Christ of the Round Table. Incidentally, the Round Table conferences were mostly for cultured people, judges, government officials, doctors, lawyers, religious leaders, perhaps about 15 of other faiths and five or six Christians, mostly Indian Christians, would be there. And then he says this at the end of the description. In my experience of these dialogues, there was not a single situation that I can remember where before the close of the Round Table Conference, Christ was not in moral and spiritual command of the situation. At the end of everything, uh, sorry, at the end, everything else had been pushed to the edges as irrelevant and Christ controlled the situation. And on one occasion, after they'd gone round and the Christians had witnessed and the Muslims had spoken as they want to and so on, a Hindu lawyer got up, took some flowers from the low-lying table before him, walked across the room, laid them at the feet of a very simple, uneducated Indian Christian clothed in, a, in an Indian homespun khadi, and kneeling at his feet said to him, you have found God, you shall be my guru. So there is an example of how we have nothing to fear from dialogue, nothing to fear from listening to other people. We will become more rather than less persuaded of the uniqueness and the finality of Jesus Christ. Next. E, we're getting to somewhat more delicate and difficult situa situations and topics. E, commitment to world evangelization and to the proclamation of the uniqueness of Jesus does not mean that we think God is totally inactive outside the church or that truth is altogether absent outside the church. No, not at all. The God we believe in is active everywhere in the world as well as in the church. He's active in all human beings. After all, he created them, and he sustains all those whom he has created. He gives them life and breath and everything else. In him, as Paul said to the Athenian uh, philosophers, in him we live and move and have our being, non-Christians. Oh, all human beings are his offspring. It's a special word he uses. We're not the children of God in the redeemed sense that God is our heavenly Father and we've been reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. Not in that sense, but we are the offspring of God by creation. He's brought us into being as his offspring. And Paul goes on, he is not far from any one of us. So there is the God he talks about, the God who is here in the world as well as in the church. Paul goes further and emphasizes what in the question time we referred to before lunch as general revelation. It's called general because it is a revelation given to the generality of the human race as opposed to special revelation which was given in Jesus Christ very particularly and in the biblical witness to Christ. That's special general revelation is the revelation of himself that God has given to the generality of the human race through the intricacy and order and beauty of the created universe and through the moral demands of our own conscience to some degree through our mind and reason as well. That's general revelation. So Paul writes in Romans 1 that the invisible nature of God is clearly seen through what is uh, through the things that are seen. is clearly made known in the things that are seen. The, the universe is a visible 
manifestation of the invisible God and his artistry. I always like the illustration, if you go sometime to St. Paul's Cathedral, you may be surprised to know, if you don't already, that there is no memorial anywhere in that great and magnificent cathedral to its architect, Sir Christopher Wren, who made it after the Great Fire of London in 1666, and it was finished at the beginning of the next century. And here everybody uh, applauds Wren and admires him for the magnificence of his cathedral, but there's no memorial. But if you go down into the crypt, his tomb is there. And on his tomb are written the words in Latin, Si circums... no, Si monumentum requiris circumspici. That is, if you are looking for his monument, look around you. There isn't any need for a monument or memorial because the cathedral is the monument. Now, I often think that God says that to us. If you are looking for evidence of me, if you're looking for my monument, look around you. It's everywhere in the created universe. So that's general revelation for which we're very thankful. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, verse 1, and the earth is also full of his glory, Isaiah 6, verse 3. So heavens and earth together reveal the glory of God. Now, that's all Paul. John, the apostle, goes even further. In the prologue to his gospel, the fourth gospel, he begins, you remember, in the beginning was the Word, the everlasting Word, the manifestation of the being of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him. So he, the eternal Word of God, the eternal Son of God, he is the agent of the creation. He is the person through whom God made the universe. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him, he goes on, was life. Life is to be found in the, in, in the Logos of God, the, the Word of God. Before the Incarnation, this is, you remember, long before Christmas Day. So, in him was life, and this life was the light of of men. The Logos of God is the light of humankind, still long before Christmas Day and the Incarnation. And then verse 9 enlarges on it. He, the eternal Word, was the true light coming into the world and giving light to everybody. It's a very important verse, John 1, 9. In other words, before he came into the world at the Incarnation, he was in the world because he'd made it. And he kept coming into the world, giving light to everybody. So we, therefore, dare to claim that anything that be, could be described as light, anything that is true or beautiful or good, anywhere in the world, derives from Christ. Of course, people don't know where it comes from, but we know it comes from the eternal Logos of God, the light of men. And we claim all beauty, truth, and goodness to come from Christ. So he's the agent of creation, and he's the light of all humankind. Nevertheless, this universal light is an aspect of God's common grace, his grace to everybody. It is not an aspect of his saving grace. The created order in all its beauty and variety reveals the glory of God. It does not reveal the grace of God to sinners. You'll never find the gospel in the stars. You can find the glory of God in the stars. You won't find the grace of God in the stars. You want to find the grace of God to sinners like us, hell-deserving sinners like us, you've got to go to Jesus. And that means going to the biblical witness to Jesus, which is the only witness there, authentic witness there is, the apostolic prophetic witness to Jesus. He, that's the special revelation, and it's a revelation of grace as opposed to a revelation of glory. So you see, all this is part of our proclamation of Christ. It's still indispensable that we do preach Christ, 
in order that people who've seen his glory may learn about his grace. So God is active outside the church, but in a different way. Now I come to the most delicate of all. Do I? Yes, F, the sixth point, which is commitment to world evangelization and to the proclamation of Jesus Christ does not mean that, or not necessarily mean, that we consign the majority of the world to hell. Now the whole subject of hell and who goes there is a, is a terrible subject for Christian people to think about. I hope that we desire with all our being that there were no such place or thing or condition as hell. I wish very much that we could never talk about hell with our tears in our eyes. I believe that there is in Scripture a whole tradition of tears which we evangelical people have forgotten about. Jeremiah wept buckets of tears because his people were rejecting his word, the word of God. Jesus wept over the impenitent city of Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul wept, he said, with tears over those who wouldn't hear the gospel. Where are our tears today? We seem to go around life grinning. You know, the great thing for Christians is to grin. I wish we could see, I'd love to see more weeping Christians about, more groaning Christians about, more people who know what it is, as in Romans 8, we groan inwardly, longing for the redemption of our bodies and so on. So never talk about hell without tears in your eyes or tears in your heart, if not actually in your eyes. So what people are asking then is this. If Jesus Christ is the only way and the only name and the only mediator, how are we to think about those who've never heard of him? Are they automatically consigned to hell? Well, there is a great need for caution in attempting to answer this question and a great need for discernment. I want to approach it uh, rather from the periphery. Uh, I want to begin with Deuteronomy 29, 29, which I hope is a verse known by heart by all of you. And if it isn't, set yourself the task this weekend of learning it by heart. Deuteronomy 29, 29 goes like this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Now there you see truth is divided into the secret things and the revealed things, the things that are known and the things that are not known. The secret things belong to God, the revealed things belong to us. So Christians are a strange blend of dogmatism and agnosticism. We are dogmatic about the things that God has plainly revealed. If God has revealed the truth, the gospel in Jesus Christ, we affirm it confidently. But there are many things that God has not revealed about which we say, I'm an agnostic, I don't know. And it's just as mature to declare yourself an agnostic as it is to declare your conviction, provided you say it about the right things. And discern between what is clearly revealed and what is not. Many of our troubles in the evangelical world today are due to the fact that our dogmatism creeps into the realm of the secret things or our agnosticism creeps into the realm of the revealed things. Keep your agnosticism to what is secret. Keep your dogmatism to what has been revealed. And there, I think, uh, is our right approach to these difficult questions about hell. It's the difference between revelation and speculation, on the other hand. So what can we affirm? What has God revealed so clearly that all of us who want to be submissive to Scripture can affirm it without too much difficulty? Well, I want to suggest a couple of things. One, Jesus Christ is the only Saviour. All human beings are sinful and guilty before God, they are, in New Testament language, perishing on the broad road that leads to destruction. And they deserve to perish. All of us are hell-deserving sinners. Nobody deserves to enter into the presence of God in this life or in the next. 
So that's quite clear, and there is no possibility of self-salvation. We cannot save ourselves. Self-salvation is not possible to Christians, and it's not possible to anybody else. We are sinners, guilty, perishing, unable to save ourselves. All that package is clearly revealed. Moreover, Jesus is the only saviour, because he is the only person who has the competence to save. And nobody else has his competence. His competence derives from who he is, the God-man. There's nobody else who's the God-man, son of God, son of man, equally divine human. So his competence to save derives from who he is and from what he's done. Born, taken our nature to himself and then born our sin and guilt and judgment in our place on the cross and then been raised from the dead. So salvation is through Christ alone. We have to affirm that as we did before lunch today. Jesus is the only saviour. Now the second thing I want to affirm is that Jesus Christ is going to save many more than will be lost. Now that may be a new idea to some of you here and obviously you all want me to try and uh, to establish this uh, point by uh, scripture which I will now proceed to try to do. In Romans 5, verses 12 to 21, we have that great uh, passage in which Paul draws a, partly a similarity and partly a dissimilarity between Adam and Christ, between the first Adam and the second Adam. He contrasts Adam and Christ, sin and grace, death and life, condemnation and justification. And in developing this antithesis between the two, he uses very interesting language. Sometimes the language of overflowing, like rivers in spate that overflow their banks. So that we read in verse 15, the grace of Jesus Christ will overflow towards the many. And then the second language he uses is an a fortiori, or how much more argument. He does it three times. For example, verse 15, if many died through the trespass of one man, Adam, how much more will God's grace overflow to the many? Therefore, we can surely affirm from this passage that the work of Jesus Christ, the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, will be far more effective than the uh, work of Adam. I could not myself believe that Adam is going to be more successful in dragging people into ruin than Jesus in lifting them to salvation. How can you believe that Adam is more successful than Jesus? Jesus is going to be much more successful than Adam in raising many more. How much more will his grace overflow? Well, now that's one. And incidentally, Calvin himself, whom some people think had a very narrow doctrine of predestination and so on, Calvin himself is quite clear that there are going to be many more saved than lost. Now the other passage on which I think we may base our argument is Revelation 7, verse 9, and the following verses, where the redeemed company, standing before the throne of God, is said to be an enormous company, so huge that nobody is able to count it. It is actually countless from every tribe and nation and people and language. So it's only then on the last day that God's promise to Abraham will be fulfilled. His promise, you remember, in Genesis 12 uh, onwards was that uh, God would give him a posterity, a seed, as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sand on the seashores of the world, and as numerous as the dust on the earth. Those are three metaphors of almost infinity. Enormous numbers of stars, of sand, grains of sand on the seashore, and of bits of dust on the floor. Now, Abraham's posterity, according to the flesh, will not be as great as that, but his posterity, spiritually, will be as great. This is Abraham's posterity. We are the children of Abraham by faith. Abraham is our father. We read about it in Romans 4 and in Galatians 3. And the children of Abraham, by faith, are going to be 
such a huge company that nobody will be able to count them. Now, there are two things I'm suggesting we believe. Here, then, is our dilemma as I draw it to a conclusion. On the one hand, Christ is the only saviour and he's going to save an innumerable company of people. On the other hand, millions have never heard of him. Now, how do we reconcile those two things? My answer is, I don't know, and it's not our responsibility to answer that question. We need to be true to what the Scripture teaches and leave to God how he's going to reconcile these apparent discrepancies. Many speculations have been made, of course, but notice the speculation. Some people say, well, Christ is going to save people or God will save them on the basis of Christ, even though they've never heard of him, because they appeal to God to have mercy upon them, as in the Old Testament. That may be, that may be, Professor Sir Norman Anderson takes that view and argues it very co cogently, but it's not clearly stated it's a speculation. Other people say, no, I think Christ is going to save people by giving them a chance to believe in him at the moment of their death. They have a vision of Jesus. Or maybe after their death in the next life. Both speculative. Possible, but we're not told it. Other people say, well, I tell you, Christ is going to save people according to how they would have responded to the gospel if they had happened to hear it. Well, that's a bright idea, <laughs> and uh, it has a little bit of biblical warrant where he says if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the mighty works, they would have repented, you know, but it's speculative. I believe the right thing to say is it's unwise to speculate. The better way is to hold on to the uniqueness of Christ the Savior, to our Christian hope that many more will be saved than lost, and then get on with the task of world evangelization to which we are committed and leave to God how he's going to win so many millions people more than are going to be lost. And I, for one, am happy to leave it to him. So the conclusion is that what is genuinely unique always has universal significance. And that is true of the unique Jesus. He de the unique Jesus demands a universal proclamation. Or as he himself put it, because all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth, we must go and make disciples of all nations. See, the unique Christ and the universal mission belong essentially together. We'll pray together. Perhaps we could have a moment of silent prayer. There may be things buzzing in our minds that we'd like to express in silent prayer to God through Christ and by the Spirit. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name by the leading of the Holy Spirit. We ask in particular as we end this day together or draw it to, towards a conclusion, we ask in particular that you will grant us that coveted gift of spiritual discernment and in particular that we may discern increasingly clearly between revelation and speculation, between what you have made known and what you have kept secret. And we ask that you will not only do that in discernment terms, but give us grace and courage to be willing to live in between these two, so that we are confident about the one and reticent about the other. Help us to be willing to live with secret things that are not yet revealed as well as with the beautiful truths that you have made known hear us and help us we humbly pray for the glory of your great name amen
Now I think Ellen is going to